Probably the first 10 years of my career. I wasn't trained on college, didn't make a big deal about it, tight's tight. In manufacture, on some spark plug boxes, it will actually tell you, tighten the spark plug till it makes contact and then do a half turn, uh, which will crush the ceiling washer. They literally have those instructions wrote on the box. Don't quote me on the half turn. Um, at 10 years into my career, let's say, plus or minus a little bit, um, I, I started to torque spark plugs. Any idea why? Stripped. So I remember stripping my first one and I really felt like this wasn't my fault. I didn't do this. How did this happen? You know what? I'm a shop owner, right? And so what I realized was by having a torque, the problem with stripping them is sometimes then if it breaks off or it's cross thread or anything else, it breaks off, it can break off inside. That's a bad day too. And especially if the spark plug is down inside a cylinder head like the Ninja where it's really deep, those are bad days. So what I started to do is uh, torque spark plugs. And then if I, if I was turning it by hand and it felt rough or bad, I quit. I'm going to clean the threads and then go back. And if I am in a problem area and I'm supposed to torque it to, let's say, 18 foot pounds, I'm going to go ahead and torque it to 10 and then to 15 and then work my whip. Now, now you, sh you two should know this and you've seen my muscle memory on that twin cam engine. Okay, when we torqued that cam cover, I went back and at 120 or whatnot, it was stripping or feeling really bad or I, we still didn't strip it, but it just didn't feel right, right? So when I torqued that, I went to the 60 and then I went to, I think, 75 and then we went to 90 and it helped torque. I will use that same application in trouble areas. Here's what you need to know. Most spark plugs are simply this. Tighten them, you know, crush the washer and then, uh, then torque it to spec, okay? The thing you have to think about on a spark plug is that we have this crushable ceiling washer. Okay, so in, inside of every other ceiling washer in an engine, what are the manufacturers always telling you to do? Crush it. Replace it. Replace them. They say every ceiling washer, a drain plug or anywhere, says it's a how many time use? One time. So how in the world are we using these spark plugs over and over and over? No, I don't. And the manual actually says, we even can, they will tell you to take a plug out of service, inspect it, and if the gap is good or the color is good, they tell you to reinsert it uh, and torque the spec, right? So one thing you have to be clear of is, okay, so here's where the spark plug seats. Let's look at, the, let's look at this engine right here. So this washer kisses right here, right? Mm -hmm. How many of you, okay, let's get our hands up again here. How many people have changed spark plugs? How many people on every single plug you've ever put in clean and make sure this area is not scratched or nicked or has half, half of it's got paint on it or anything else? After my first one came out, that's when I started doing yeah, it. Yeah, right, right. You had to have a failure to learn that. So we're choosing to take a look at this. So what we're going to do is anytime we put a plug in a head is we make sure the ceiling surfaces. Isn't it funny that we'll do that on a cover? We'll do that on a head? We'll do that on an intake? We'll, we'll sit here and we'll inspect these areas and then this, this one we just completely overlook. On a four stroke, we might leak some uh, air in there as well. When the piston goes down, what's it going to bring with it? Dirt. Debris. Dirt, air, right? And uh, same thing here. So this is an area that is extremely overlooked and uh, what will happen is as this vibrates and works its way out, we've actually seen where customers have come in and said, hey, my bike quit running. And we'll go over and we'll kick the bike over. Because you can't always see the spark plug might be up under a gas tank or whatnot. So we'll kick the bike over and go, yep, no compression. And then when I take the gas tank off, I literally get the tank off and the spark plug's still attached to the plug wire. Just mm -hmm. hanging there? It's just hanging there. It came loose, vibrated out. That How it could even rotate inside that spark plug just seems to be impossible. But it happens. It's, it's, it's rare, but it'll, it'll happen. So I want you to uh, uh, put some real uh, different um, attitudes about spark plugs and their ceiling surfaces, okay? Um, have I ever and do I ever put a spark plug in without torquing it? Um, uh, if, I, if I have a torque wrench, it's getting torqued. I have to grab a 3H drive regardless to install the plug, so why would I not just grab my torque wrench? Make sense? All right, you're going to learn a lot about spark plugs in our electrical class in... Uh, January. We get very intense. Uh, one company even has a training certificate opportunity um, within that we're going to try and be part of this year called Denzo. Remember we talking about that yesterday? Mm -hmm. They actually have an online training certification thing. Or, I'm sorry, not Denzo, Autolite. Autolite. Autolite plugs. All right. Well, so in class there, we identified this as a place to leak or make it go lean, right? 
We're just going to keep working our way down. How about the head gasket? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So if this is leaking, now what else did we say this could be made of? Uh, the metal copper. And fiber. Copper. Carbon fiber. O-ring. I haven't seen a carbon fiber one. This composite. O-rings is the big one I'm looking for. Okay, oh, so we have O-rings. Okay, so let's just keep going down here. Our intake gasket, you see that right there? How about the fact that this rubber gets cracked? Well, that's a big thing. Okay, so the intake boot itself can get fatigued and cracked, and that'll be a problem. Okay. Intake gasket, so intake rubber boot here. So when we identified intake, we meant everything encompassing an intake. Okay, are we talking about the air filter? Yep. No. No, because it's... Air filters will allow dirt in, but anything that allow an engine to go lean has to be after the carburetor. Uh -huh. If we have a dirty air filter that's torn or whatnot, it's for surely going to let dirt in, but it doesn't let, you know, it's not going to make it significant. You'd have to have no air filter to make it run that significantly different. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and let's make sure we understand this. I'm talking about measurable, measurable amount of leak. Okay? The base gasket... Is that an, a place that air could get into the engine? Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. I agree too, right? Okay, we're going to have to get a little bit of x-ray vision here other than one more spot. On this Suzuki, do you see how it uses a gasket? Yep. Yeah. Okay, this, this is part of the transmission, but there's a sealing ring around just the engine, okay? Case just like this case right here. We're talking about just right along here, just the engine side of it, okay? All right, um, and this could be sealant, right? Okay, now of our list, we were down to one thing too. We said the left crank seal. Okay, that's 99.9% .9 of the time. So this is the front of the engine. This is the back of the engine. Carburetor, air filter, exhaust, right? And you see the wires coming out of here. So what's probably under this cover? The ignition. Okay, we don't have a battery on most of our two strokes. So there is no charging system. It's a, magneto, we, it's a magneto, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that there can't be because you might have a, a battery for lighting coils. There's, there, it's possible, but most likely not. Okay, so out of the wire side, okay, on a two-stroke, is there ignition? So this is dry, okay? There's no fluid or anything in here. So if this gasket leaks from this cover or the seal underneath it, the crank seal, that's going to allow air to get in, making us lean. Okay, so I said there was one mystery area. There's seven total when testing. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, mm -hmm. we have six areas we can make it lean. Does anybody know where the, uh, the potential one when testing would be? The tool. Okay, we're going to insert a tool in here. We're going to block this off and we're going to push air inside of this whole system and look for leaks. Well, if the tool is reading that I have a leak, it could be that I'm leaking on my fitting. I could fail a motor that doesn't really have a problem, okay? So uh, let's talk about there's one area on a two-stroke like this that can make it run rich when it has a, a transmission in the same housing. Any idea? The right side seal. The right side crank seal. Because inside of here, when we get our motors apart here, is once this whole cover's off here, there's oil in the transmission and all the way around the clutch and primary gear. So there's an oil, uh, an oil in these two cavities here, if you will. So the seal that sits behind there, when it goes bad, the right crank seal, is uh, when the piston goes up, it actually draws transmission oil into the engine. Okay, that will, uh, it's going to uh, make it too rich and that's something that will follow the plug out. If that leaks, the motor doesn't blow up. When that leaks, what happens? It follows your plug. Follows up the plug. So what happens? It quits running. When the right crank seal leaks, it quits running. Okay. When the right crank seal leaks, you lose power. Okay. Because we're actually putting too much oil in there. What does extra oil do to the fuel? It dilutes it, which means we're gonna have less available BTUs to burn uh, out of that energy. Does that make sense? So now we're getting into diagnostics. Is this making maybe a little more sense from the video? Yeah. You know, talking about the different things that they're getting into and servicing. I think as far as that video goes, when you guys want to watch it through on your own to learn more about the servicing, I think you could keep doing that. My main goal was, are we really understanding the two cycles, 
Uh, we've got a Yamaha video that we'll uh, get to watch too that does a really good job of this as well. Uh, give me some takeaways from that video. So your takeaway is theory. Okay, okay, we'll we'll build up with the compression. okay Brian took a Brian took up a carbon buildup will increase the compression because if I let's take a look at how that happens. Would you guys agree? Would you guys agree that when this is at top dead center, okay, right there, that this is a measurable space in here? Yeah. Okay? And would you agree that if I add anything on top of that piston or that carbon buildup, that it reduces the area in there? Yep. Yeah. Which makes the compression go up. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that was a good takeaway. So where might you, let me ask you this. Do you think you ever take an engine apart, and let's say the manual calls for 170 PSI, and you do a compression test and it has 170 PSI, but there's still a problem? Yeah. Yeah. If my ring is wore out, or my cylinder is wore out, but I have a ton of carbon up here, I'll sell higher compression. If I were to clean the carbon off and redo the compression test, my worn out ring will then show itself. Okay, so, but we don't reassemble engines like that. We would measure things and find out that the ring is out of service, the piston is out of service, the cylinder is out of service. That's what we would do. Once we take it apart, we would never just try and put it back together and hope it held its compression. Okay, it wouldn't be very time efficient, that right? Would be, that would be more of a, you do your compression test to see if it's worth it to break it down. Yeah. And then when you're breaking it down, you'll find out if something is messed up. And we got tricked. We got tricked because our compression test matched the book. Okay, so can, can anybody in here think of a way of something you could do without taking the engine apart and try and determine whether you think there's got some real crazy excessive compression? Okay, so look in the exhaust. If there's like lots of excess carbon. Yeah. Uh, which, which hole's bigger to look through, the exhaust port or the spark plug? Spark plug. Which hole's bigger to look through? Larger in size, right? Yeah. Okay, so if I'm trying to look in the spark plug, well, it's not very big, is it? Okay, but if I took the exhaust off and watch, if I take the exhaust off and do this and move the piston down, do I get a really good view inside of there now? Oh, and then you can light through the top of it. Yeah, 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 you know, I get a, I get a really good view. And, and when the piston's down, you know, I can really see that whole piston versus one just small spot. Could you take the spark plug out if you had a bore scope and look down the cylinder that way? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Now, if I do this, if I hold the piston up a little bit in the exhaust port, just where I could see the ring, will that allow me to see the side of the piston too? Yeah. Like if I do this, and I have a whole bunch of blow-by, the ring is bad, what's going to be below the ring? Do you see all this blow-by? Yeah. What's that tell you about the ring? Yeah, yeah that ring leaked, didn't it? Okay, so I can take the exhaust off and I get to see this stuff. Do you guys see the piston port on this one, how high it is? Yeah. Was this done afterwards? It was cleaned, yeah. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately. Who knows why, I don't know. Um, look at all the blow-by right there. Okay. All right, so I think you guys are building a relationship of how to look at things, right? Do I even need to take cylinder off? Okay, so why would I maybe not take the cylinder off? Why would I just want to look in there? Any any ideas? Save time. Save time. Why? Uh, what we always we always have two things going on: time and money. Money, time and money, right? Those are our two our two factors. So Mason, you're working in a shop. You're over in Fort Dodge, and a customer comes in and says, "Hey, my son's a uh, little PT uh, eighty. Uh, uh, quit running." Um, but you know what? I don't, I don't really know if it's worth putting any money into it. I see that you have an, a real nice, uh, you know, five-year newer one on the show floor. Uh, you know, maybe I just want to see if it's worth fixing. Does this make sense? Instead of him doing the labor, taking the engine all apart, having a couple hundred dollar bill, he could have probably a fifty dollar bill to tell the customer, "Hey, you know what? Your cylinder. I'm looking through your exhaust. Your cylinder's all scored up. That's going to be boring. It's going to need a piston." Um, uh, the last service history we've ever seen of this vehicle, we pulled service records and it had a weak rod the last time we did a top end in it. It's probably not worth fixing. You're more likely to, to get that trade-in. 
Does that make sense? Or it might be a deal of if your customer just doesn't have the money, because what, what's a top end on a two-stroke cost? Any idea? A Harley was about eight hundred to a thousand dollars, depending where you went, right? To do those two cylinders. Okay, we still got one cylinder. We still got boring and machining. It is not uncommon for just a top end to cost anywhere from four to six hundred dollars. Four to six hundred bucks. What did you say? Mine was about six hundred. Six hundred. Okay. Now, did you have to get your cylinder replated? I just bought a whole new cylinder. Oh, bought a whole new cylinder. That's an option too. Okay. Was that your own labor? Just six hundred in parts? Wow, okay, look at that. Okay, so if I could just tell my customer, now here's what I like too, is I, I hate, I hate handing a customer, I hate a customer comes in with a completely assembled vehicle and I hate handing it back like the bench there. Um, because what's gonna happen is if they say, geez, you know what Shane, I still don't have the money right now, but they're a good customer of mine, who's probably gonna get that job in the future? You. I am, there's a really good, if I have a good relationship with them, when they gather the money, I'm probably gonna get the job. So any work that I can do without taking stuff off, I want to. You get what I'm saying? I'm not gonna reassemble an entire engine for free though either. You know what I mean? If they want it all completely taken down to decide that, then that's where we're gonna be. I've had customers give me the go ahead on the top end, and once that piston was off, I grabbed that rod and it's got a bad rod and I have to give them the bad news, hey, sorry, it's your rod's bad. You know what I mean? There's no way to check that without disassembling. 